go. All right. Hello and welcome to another Warriors Press podcast. And today I'm going to talk to Arval about the ins and outs of his Christian Platonism. And I'm going to take the, while I have nothing against this view of the world at all, I'm just going to take the viewpoint of someone who is sort of critical or ask him critical sounding questions. So I just wanted to preface with that because I know Arval won't, but some people uh, can be very sensitive about such things. So uh, Arval, <laughs> introduce yourself, I guess, and tell us, tell us about, tell us a bit what you can start, start with the summary of this belief of yours. Yeah, sure. Well, I think, uh, you know, I came to my views in terms of metaphysics before I was familiar with Plato or really familiar with like the traditional Christian theological tradition. So I always kind of found my own way in philosophy. Um, like in high school and college, I was very into developments in physics. And I took the kind of philosophy of John Wheeler that metaphysics and physics are not ultimately separate. So by following then some of the arguments that the philosophical arguments that surround modern interpretations of quantum dynamics, you know, cosmological speculations like Bostrom simulation argument, things like that, I kind of reached uh, a set of conclusions that I noticed corresponded quite well to the traditional uh, dogmas of Hinduism. So then I got into Hinduism. And then after that, I got into Platonism and I read Plato through the, the lens of Vedanta. And after that, then uh, I got into like the perennialist traditionalist school authors and started thinking that, you know, there is something to the notion that you have to have some particular set of rituals that, you know, constitutes your practice, like purely theoretical uh, spirituality doesn't really work. It needs to have substance to it and it needs to be a communal experience. And for me, you know, I was raised Catholic and was a believing Catholic on and off. Um, so I, that was the natural fit and in meditation under some kind of inspiration, I just had a, an experience of, of Christ and the idea that you have to follow a guru. You have to follow some figure that's further down the path than yourself lined up uh very well with the way that i felt about jesus when i was a kid so it just kind of matched my upbringing uh, it was what i think i needed at that time and so i embraced christianity in, in a very kind of basic almost hyper protestant sense in a gospel message sense in that you know god descends to earth and if we believe in his representative here then he can guide us to salvation um, and I don't see that as being fundamentally at odds with the spirit of Neoplatonism. Um, you know, lately I've gotten much more into the Neoplatonists, especially Proclus. And, you know, Proclus is this adamant polytheist in an age of Christianity. Um, so it seems like, you know, he would not endorse the path that I specifically have taken. However, there are hints in uh, Proclus even that this mode of of worship, you know, interfacing with the divine through a human intermediary is just kind of appropriate. You know, that's the way their scholastic hierarchies worked. Um, it mirrors that idea, like in Hinduism, that you treat your guru as a representative of God. Um, and Proclus was all about that idea that in order to ascend back to your ultimate cause, you have to go through many intermediaries. Um, so, you know, contemplation of the divine itself it is it lacks something it laps, lacks that kind of substance that we need um because we are very far from that level you know there are many intermediaries so it just makes sense to to kind of worship and think about the divine through a representative figure that kind of embodies the highest values um you know in in a human life and yeah, Christ is arguably um, at odds in terms of his ethical teachings with like the idea of the avatar in Hinduism or um, any of the theophanies in Neoplatonism. 
because of this idea of forgiveness. So that is the one real essential core doctrine of Christianity that I was convinced of for um, like reasons of metaphysical argument that I kind of came to on my own. I came to agree with this principle of divine reciprocity. You know, if you forgive others, you will be forgiven. That's the radical teaching of Christianity that you don't find in Neoplatonism, you don't find in Vedanta. You know, there is the idea of following a, a savior figure, following a guru, you know, that's all well and good. But, um, you know, Christ is the only spiritual teacher that really emphasized this kind of radical forgiveness and a capacity for like a mystic conversion, um, which clearly existed in Plato as well. Like the philosophical path begins with a conversion of the mind, but the idea that you can be aided by uh, higher beings in that conversion and that it's this easy thing, that it's a, a gift of grace almost that doesn't require all of this um, you know, philosophical preparation for that essential conversion. You know, once you convert, I would say, yes, the philosophical path is the only way and you have to, you know, dig into it for yourself and understand and learn for yourself. But it can begin in the way that many Protestants experience that Christian conversion moment. Um, so basically, you know, I've, I've come to interpret Christ as something like an avatar figure definitely a representative of the divine, regardless of the particular Christology uh, you want to nail down. And then there are differences like of the metaphysics of the avatar in Hinduism as well. Um, you know, I, I was influenced to some extent by, um, what's this guy's name? <laughs> he was a Sri, I want to say Krishnamurti, but I know that's not it because he wasn't even a real Hindu. He was like a theosophist. Uh, and then he left them. Ramakrishna. Um, I read the kind of biography of, of Ramakrishna and, and his philosophy of his take on Hinduism, basically, where his approach was to experience all of the ritual forms that were available to him, to, uh, available to him in India. And clearly that's you know quite a number of practices. They're Christians, mm. uh, Muslims, all sorts of different Hindus. So yeah. he was like a, a savant when it came to the mystical experience. So maybe he's not the best person to look to when it comes to like the metaphysics of incarnation of the divine. But uh, he was singled out as an avatar because of this ability he had to reach these spiritual states, uh, samadhi, nirvana, you know, whatever you want to call it. And the way he looked at being an avatar is that you, you have just like the kind of dual um, natures in Christ, you have the human nature and the divine nature. Ramakrishna would say that about himself, like insofar as he acts as a representative of the divine, he is an avatar. But insofar as he has his own personal desires and failings and shortcomings, he's not. So, I mean, I don't want to uh, kind of minimize the special status that I uh, accord to Christ when it comes to, because all of us in certain ways embody the divine. You know, I take the kind of Joseph Campbell approach and perennialist approach generally to different mythological systems. There are many masks of God. We come to know God through many faces and we come to know God through each other even. But there is one best way of representing, of representing the divine nature in a human form. And I think what Christ did healing the sick, you know, gathering people together in faith, uh, like spurring people into a new kind of community um, is what I would expect uh, a, an avatar figure to do. Uh, and then also combine that with the kind of prophecies of the end times. You know, it just seems like a, a, a kind of dynamic that you could tap into where you set up a, a kind of preparation for the coming age. So at the beginning of the age of Pisces, uh, Christ has his first incarnation and spreads the message and then allows it to travel through the world, right? And transform the world in major ways. And then he'll come and kind of reap that harvest at the end and institute the new order. And I am of the opinion that you need a new order for the world as a whole. Um, I mean, the elites obviously have thought that for many years. Um, they've talked about their idea of a new world order, but it, the idea is older in Christianity that you will need this. There are technological reasons why 
some something has to give uh, when it comes to like cross-cultural dialogues. We don't want another Cold War. We don't want another World War. We can't really afford it. Like the world has to learn how to live in peace. And I think Jesus specifically is that representative of the divine that most people have heard about that, the, you know, the teaching has, have spread the furthest. And so that's why I kind of put my, my stock in him as a, an act of faith. But uh, yeah, that's kind of how I look at it in general. Okay, that's extremely thorough. So much so, I wish I would expect from you. Um, and so much so that it throws me into a tailspin of like, you've answered many of the questions I was going to ask and then also open new ones. But um, well, even just like the, what you said at the end there, how do you like, if I could just maybe uh, if I could ask you some quick series of questions and just get like briefish answers as much, brief <laughs> as like yeah, yeah. summarized answers. Like, so you say, so what about, isn't there, there's more Buddhists in the world and uh, the Christians, is, is there not? Like, for example, if in terms of- I don't of know world, if that's true. I think there's you know? slightly more Christians. Is there really? Okay. What's the largest religion in the world, you know? The I, largest religion is still Christianity, although Islam is growing faster. Is it? Okay, I didn't know this. Okay, that's a mistake on my part, that's fine. So it's fair to say then that you initially, <clears throat> you didn't come into Platonism with a Christian bias in the first place. You reached backwards into what you were used to seeing, uh, seeing a use through the, as you say, the, the, the guru archetype. But so in your, when you, you don't have any sort of bias against uh, pagans and you see sort of see things a bit syncretically. Is that true as well? You're not the type of Christian to think all these people are going to hell kind of thing. No. Yeah. I think uh, the way that most pagans, initially accepted Jesus was like an additional figure in their pantheon. So I don't think the existence of the avatar negates the reality of other uh, supernatural beings. Oh, really? Okay. So that would be, you, you'd be at odds with a lot of Christians talking like that, obviously. Well, a lot that. of Christians have interpreted talk of the gods as really just talk of angels. And at that point, it's a, a semantic debate it's really a debate about vocabulary you know call them gods call them angels they're higher beings than us they're more perfect than us um right so i don't see it's, your, it's your catholic background that allows you these uh <laughs> wild eccentricities well it's like if you read uh what is it dante isn't it doesn't he have an account of plato and so is it socrates uh, socrates and plato in um purgatory where they're still just for being pagans they're still in purgatory even but he recognizes their incalculable um you know, genius as well, which is... Yeah, I think so. I haven't read Dante, but... Yeah, he has an account. He has a really, like, loving, you know, um, honoring account of... the of. Pretty sure he meets... Is it Socrates? I can't remember now. Maybe both. But they are in purgatory because they weren't, uh, you know, born at the time of, of Christ or whatever. But that's... Uh, that's that's besides the point, I guess. So you, so you weren't... Didn't have a Christian bias going into it. You were raised Catholic like me. And um, you have a sort of almost quasi-Protestant revelation way of viewing it now <laughs> since you had this meditation experience. Is that correct? That's what set me on the path generally. And since then, I've always kind of taken it as, you know, I'm a skeptic at heart at a certain level. So it's a hypothesis that Jesus is this incarnation figure. I think there is a strong case to be made that whoever created the gospels directly or indirectly whoever was the inspiration for this movement was a genuine spiritual teacher and i think of a very high caliber you know it did transform whole nations in the way that very few other faiths have been able to do like it stopped the irish for example from constantly killing each other when they got christianity so that's an achievement <laughs> yes my, my people yes the yes the warring tribes and there, there's a really harrowing um I'm pretty sure Survive the Jedi said it was like one of these post-Christian um, attempts at slander. There's an account of like an Irish pagan ceremony where some guy, I believe he has sex with a horse and he kills it and eats it. It's, and during like a big festival, sort of like a Christmas, like a pagan festival. So there was some pretty harsh uh, stuff. Uh, I again, I don't know how true that is, but um, what was I going to ask you then? I've lost it now. Uh, mm -hmm. So your... Shit, what was I going to ask you? <laughs> That's sure. Thinking about having sex with a horse just threw it out of my mind altogether. Uh, yeah, it's a very striking image. 
Well, just the point that like Christianity has been efficacious in improving the morals, I think, of the All European right, yeah. nations and, and African nations. Where well, it's that's, you have to admit that's arguable in the very same thing. The forgiveness thing has at least now not reached the point. But, but the universe, this is the main complaint many pagans nowadays would, would have is the universalism and the forgiveness doctrine. They turn the other cheek, which has been taken to an extreme now a lot of people would say and think what do you think mm -hmm. about that well it can be taken to an extreme when you you give forgiveness without first you know hearing the repentance like forgiveness is contingent on uh that turning on that conversion you know that's that's when it's possible to forgive i mean forgive in your heart those who do you wrong i think that's really just like a, a prudent piece of advice to keep yourself level-headed in the face of antagonists like what it, how does it help you to harbor this kind of deep resentment hatred you know whatever it is i think it's you're probably better off if you don't hold all of that in yourself and do kind of believe that anyone could in principle be converted believe that you know the nature the essential nature of the so soul the core of the soul has something divine in it and everyone is worthy of a second chance down the line. Um, but then like when it comes to practical politics and how you deal with people, you don't just let them walk all over you and you have to enforce the norms of your society. And Christianity, you know, traditionally has had this kind of division between the state and the church. So that although the church teaches this universal forgiveness, the state is given a degree of autonomy and, you know, our judicial norms, I think, have been very effective. They did grow out of the ju judicial norms of the Catholic Church. Um, so it's certainly... Yeah, those were, those are really Roman. Those are those are originally yes, Roman. that is true. Right. Yeah, true. Roman, yeah. Um, but in any case, it proves that this doctrine of forgiveness didn't inhibit the establishment of, you know fair, just legal systems. Um, it also, there is a kind of maybe a hidden power in the universalism and like too uh, giving, too forgiving nature of of Western civilization. That's, that's why the world has emulated us for so long. Like we have exerted this soft power. We, we are still in a position as the West in general to set the tone for how humanity moves forward because we didn't have, uh, we weren't driven by an ideology that said, you know, we are superior to everyone else and we're going to impose our reign over them. We had, it was a, a new kind of imperialism, based, like, you know, the white man's burden based on this idea that we have an obligation to lift others up. And it's that kind of good spirited, you know, altruistic, um, aspect of the West that has actually given it a, a, a lot of power and a lot of potential for shaping the future. And it's that uh, shaping of the future, I think, that is important because we're dealing with a, a scenario where there will be and are technologies that threaten mass uh, loss of life, threaten, you know, different types of uh, biological weapons being released, like the our capacity for self-destruction is increasing with more advanced technology. And it doesn't seem like that's slowing down. Like it's, it becomes easier and easier for fewer and fewer people with less and less money to uh, exert more um, or affect more harm in general, which means we're going to have to find ways of like bringing about a more peaceful state of things between nations, within nations, and, you know, I don't know if China is is looking to do that. I don't know of any other imperial actor that's going to steward the world from a universalist perspective, you know, protecting uh, the the sacredness or sanctity of human life all over the planet. Like it, it does take that kind of universalist um, attitude to exert that influence. And I personally believe that is a necessary thing because of the times that we're living in. We can't have nations going to, to war with one another in perpetuity when we have nukes, we have these, you know, right. bio weapons. What about, what about issues of the Malthusian population explosions and overconsumption uh, from, pop, from too much sanctity for human life, maybe? Would you? Oh, like, you know, that, 
excessively feeding Africa and well, frankly, frankly, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, it's possible to be misguided in the way that you try to help. Uh, I'm not saying it's always been implemented in the best way. Like, I think it's a fair characterization. Like, white guilt is certainly spiritually a descendant of the Catholic guilt, <laughs> ultimately. And you know that I would see see that as an aberration and a corruption, um, just like there are corrupt versions of paganism, you know, like right. anything so you've, corrupted. You've kept your profound belief in Plato and respect for Plato through all, all your, and you've reconciled it in, inside yourself with everything, not everything, but say your Christian belief. Do you ever have feel hypocrisy or a conflict within yourself between the two over any trivial thing even? Well, um, you know, there, I don't see a lot of inherent disagreement. Uh, the, I'm curious about the precise role, like where that stacks up in the metaphysical picture that, for example, Proclus paints, like where would the closest an, uh, analogy for the avatar be in that kind of system? You know, is it like the first among souls? Because it that also seems to be the world soul. You know, there is in each. So you would order have, you would have being, a belief. Sorry, sorry. Let me just. You would have a belief in the world soul or the super soul. You would. You would. Yeah, I a, think there is the world yeah. soul is there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, in each order, there is one first example, one RK of the type, and I think humanity, maybe the form of man, is closer to the divine man. You know, even in Proclus the imparticipable monad of each series is necessarily connected to um, the henads there. It's in the line of divine beings. And so the imparticipable man, uh, the arche of man would be divine. And so maybe the first participant of the form of man would be uh, the avatar figure, uh, I guess. Yeah, I don't see any conflict there. Right. Well, so so you're sort of like me in that I'm not adverse to Christianity just because I was raised with it and the West has been involved in it for centuries and we can't, morally, we can't be outside it is what I found. It would be hip hypocritical and untrue for to me to totally renounce it and say, I'm not this anymore because we are inescapably it to a certain degree. But take, mm -hmm. once again, take the devil's advocate against your position. Like a lot of people would say, you know, the feudal age, which we spoke of, which seemed to have to be quite rigorous in traditional values was also sort of still very pagan in a lot of ways. And what may, and people would argue it's only the perfected Christianity has only come about quite recently, even though it's sort of post-Christian and there's a lot of atheism, but the total belief in equality and, and so forth is the weakening end road of, of this belief. But um, let me just say, let me phrase it this way. And you, you said you had a belief in, or a respect for biblical, like people talk about biblical philosophy, let's say. Um, but whenever I read the Bible, like, frankly, I didn't get a lot out of it. You know, <laughs> there was mm -hmm. a lot of pages of reading who descended from whom and the same kind of, you know, fantastical talk of giants and dragons and things. And, you know, it, it's sort of like foreign sounding history, frankly. Um, and there's the philosophy, say, of the Sermon on the Mount, which you've kind of talked about, mm -hmm. which is the forgiveness doctrine. But even that's not laid out in a platonic, like no one's Jesus doesn't sit down and reason you through rationally you know or talk about math and stuff like right do you have well, any he's following plato's advice and doing that i mean he doesn't reveal he has his esoteric doctrine that's pretty explicit like he'll give an analogy to the people of uh you know when the seed falls on the, the road then the birds will come eat it when it's put in the proper soil it'll, it'll flourish or whatever and people are asking you know what does that mean what are you saying and he waits until he gets in private and then explains it to the apostles uh, I think there is evidence that Christianity was initially an initiatic tradition. Uh, yeah. That's Joseph Campbell's take, and I pretty much agree with it. You know, in the vein well, of like a Mithraism, something like that. Okay, what are, what are the examples of profound, profound, explicitly profound philosophy that you've take, taken out of it that you would see that you would see Jesus as a, fi a Platonic figure? Um, well, the idea that conversion is. Uh, by a higher power, by the sacrifice of a higher power. Like there's echoes of the Dionysian mysteries in that, you know, the sacrifice mm -hmm. of, of Bacchus or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, that, that 
it's all given in symbolic terms and it's meant to affect this change primarily. I mean, the Bible isn't written in terms of philosophical treatises, but uh, I think that the doctrine of reciprocity, you know, as, as you are um, internally, uh, that's what you will receive. Um, that like the, ultimately the inner vessel is more significant than the outer uh, side of the cup. I haven't read honestly the new Testament in, probably more than a year. So a lot of these examples are not very fresh in my mind. There's like uh, the gospel of, of, uh, or not gospel, the letter of James. Um, I remember having uh, a lot of affinity with myself and I could see like the, the concept of the, the universality of the pneuma coming in, in the way that he talks about the spirit. And that's, I mean, obviously they use the same word. There is this platonic concept of a, a medium that interpenetrates all mundane things and that we participate of and that part, partly our soul shapes, right? We have our pneumatic vessel or vehicle that is associated with us, but it is connected with the pneuma in, in all of us, right? We're connected by this force. And so you have that in a simplified form, like the Holy Spirit is a simplified version of the doctrine of the pneuma. I think that comes across in Christianity. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I think when Nietzsche says that Christianity is Platonism for the masses, I'm like, yeah, that sounds right. I mean, there are even <laughs> quotes, practically quotes of Socrates uh, that are in the mouth of Jesus in the Gospels. Um, the story of Socrates in some ways is quite similar to the story of Jesus. Uh, I mean, in, in the Republic, Plato advocates, or at least Socrates advocates, having that kind of po popular myth or noble lie about their origins. <laughs> it's like, well, in a certain way, the Jews took Plato to heart more than anybody else. And they actually, you know, did what he recommended. Yeah, that's true. So, but that is the, like I said, the foreign aspect of the, and the insanity of the Old Testament is a lot, obviously a lot of people have uh, problems with that as well, which is, you know, as terms of a background myth, not only is it sort of foreign, it isn't i mean you just wish the you just wish it could have been grafted onto like the myth the greek myths or something a bit <laughs> yeah know. yeah uh the the old testament has a lot of good features and bad features because i think it was a, a composite like the higher critics believe there are many different layers of these texts Oh, and, like your pal, your pal, you were mentioning that uh looked into the the people who, who uh yeah. first uh, wrote it down in the alexandria Right, uh, the yeah. Septuagint translation, Russell Gmerkin yeah. is the guy who's written on it. Right, right. I think it's a, a very interesting hypothesis, but you don't even have to go that far to just accept that the Old Testament was compiled over hundreds of years, and there are various levels of philosophical or spiritual insight in different sections of the Old Testament. Okay, can um, I stop you there? What would be a, yeah. a, a profound example of that, in your opinion? I think the psalmist um, had genuine spiritual insight also like like what like that. like following the spirit like when he says like the way that david talks about if he is the psalmist how he leads his troops it's this sensitivity to a kind of intuitive motion like he'll see the the literally the wind blow through the leaves and then like he, he'll know that god is communicating something to him so again it's this idea of like being led by the spirit, which doesn't come across as strongly in, in Platonism, but it is there in, in, uh, in the Jewish tradition, this idea of, I think it's kenosis, you know, like being inhabited by a divine spirit and letting a divine spirit kind of act through you. It's similar to um, some of the practices in theurgy, you know, after you kind of perfect the contemplative virtues, you go on to uh paradigmatic virtues where you are like in the image of those divine beings and that's similar to the idea of, of kenosis allowing higher spirits to act through you or like hey uh socrates following his daimon following his spirit so i think um that faith and trust in higher beings uh, is certainly there uh, in a high degree with an emphasis on faith um, there, there are some moral lessons. I mean, typically you see that when 
um, the people, the Jewish people or any other people depart from God's law. There is shortly thereafter some kind of punishment. It's just a lot of demonstrations of karmic principles. Um, karmic, right. You could see it that but, way. Yeah. 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 It, but then not always. Like, I think there are sections of the Old Testament that were kind of constructed in Machiavellian ways. I think there there's just a lack of integrity to the whole document um, because it was compiled over a long span of time. And I don't take everything in the Old Testament as being divinely inspired. I do believe that many scriptures are divinely inspired. I think the Tao Te Ching is divinely inspired. I think, oh, okay. you know, the... The, the Vedas, especially the Upanishads, are divinely See, inspired. Yeah, your ability, your ability to take that view, which is the mature view, in my opinion, is what makes it. This is this isn't like pigeonholing a diehard Christian on this issue. Like I, I get lots of Christians who, if I, I made a post recently about philosophy, and they're like, philosophy is terrible. Everything about it. All you need is Christianity, and just despise the idea of philosophy. And this kind of, I see this attitude. I don't know mm -hmm. where it comes from. I guess that's a real kind of. Where does that come from? That's kind of like a it's, super born again kind of. It's just the attitude that wins out. You know, the least tolerant group uh, will generally have an advantage. So I think yes, it's right. looking at evolution there. So all philosophy has got to go. Just throw it all away. Yeah, well, it, it has to be the attitude of a certain type of per Like not everyone gets the concept of, you know, perspectives and worldviews and that we, you know, there are different legitimate ways of interpreting the world like for some people the narratives that they've heard since they were a child they just are the world you know there's no yeah. separation between like and god bless Genesis them. I mean, story. such innocence such beautiful innocence <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah yeah but it's a large percentage of humanity that will inevitably be in that mentality and so for them to keep their moral system um integrated and coherent they can't afford to speculate outside of their system it is more of a cosmopolitan type. It's somebody who's kind of outside of just the one parochial system that is able to think about that uh, different manifestations of the divine in different contexts. But yeah, not everyone needs to grasp it. And one of the downsides of perennialism, traditionalism, having that more open-minded, seeing the divine in many different forms is that you can't exactly organize a community of worship on those principles, you know, that it's the, the esoteric exoteric divide exists for a reason. It's just how we yeah. have to do it. Yeah, frankly, I'm just waiting for someone to come along with big enough balls to just openly start their own cult and have it, you know, even if it's a variation of Christianity, this invariably happens whether I want it to or not. I mean, someone, some mm -hmm. sort of David Koresh type character, somebody uh, succeeds yeah. succeeds at morphing and creating a, a variation of the cult which is needed it seems like this kind of change is required as part well this is uh, some uh, this is a key to perennialism perenni perennialism perhaps i can say but um before i lose it out of my brain i want to say to you so even just to take the uh, once again the the attack position the you all your references to profound philosophy in the bible old and new are really you have to admit yourself in a reference to metaphoric, you know, it's not like laid out strictly mm -hmm. and precisely yeah. as in Plato, for instance. Yeah. And you're making sort of loose associations. This obviously means this and that. And this, you know, that's well known as a, what you have to do to get through it or to make to make sense of it in that way, if, if that's what you choose. Mm -hmm. to do. Um, so and you're saying if the Plato alone, you so you believe that Plato alone, like, say, I believe, um, what's his name? Pierre Grimes would, I think, is one of the first people I heard. I don't know others have to advocate that everything you need is in Plato and Homer. Um, and then if you you're a philosopher, yeah, <laughs> not all of us yeah, are philosophers. So you don't think you, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that it's enough on its own. You that you could interpret or reinterpret it. You 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 feel for sure you need this. You can't read Plato as a child, you know, but you can understand the stories in the Old Testament in the New Testament because they're even stories. There, even you there, need there stories. Just, yeah, the stories and but they lay it out as you say it's for the masses and that's great but as you know you're talking we're talking about your personal belief you're not a regular mm. one of the masses by any yeah, means yeah. you know and for them it's sort of like do this do that or else you know a lot of it really boils down to that um, yeah you know the binary uh, heaven hell distinction that's really what keeps them in order which is you know mm -hmm. good it's a very functional uh effective system frankly <laughs> but um yeah uh, for my own spiritual practice no I, I don't think that's the approach the neoplatonists took 
either. I mean, they didn't put this emphasis solely on Plato and Aristotle and explicit, you know, uh, contemplative philosophy. That is not the highest aspect of their worship. And like, for example, in Plato's or sorry, Proclus's commentary on the Republic, he addresses why Socrates advocates expelling the poets and he defends Homer and defends the poets by saying, you know, actually they are not, they were never meant to be this kind of mass consumption, general myth of the people. They are meant to be read symbolically in, in a ritual context by those who have like the keys to decipher what's truly being said. And that there, it's a, it's a mystic function. What symbols are meant to like, I think Carl Jung defines a symbol as a uh, signifier with a transcendent signified. So that means we can't conceptually grasp entirely what is behind the symbol. I mean, you have to, in developmental terms, you shouldn't expect that all uh, concepts will be uh, conceptually available, accessible to reason off the bat. We have to develop two higher concepts. We have to develop these things. But before we explicitly get there with dianoia, you know, discursive reasoning, we uh, have like an, an anticipation of it, or there's the, the kind of archetypal preparation that occurs in the subconscious. Like when you're working on a really difficult problem, I don't know about how you experience it phenomenologically, but for me, it's like there's a shape, there's a, you know, it, it's not the full system. I don't see exactly where every piece connects, but there's some meaning that I'm aiming at that I'm trying to develop conceptually. And that that structure of meaning that is not fully like a form, accessible. Like a form? The like form, a form. Is yeah, it's a form. Uh, it that is you're anticipating and you're trying to develop it with conceptual reasoning, but it's not there yet. That's a, a transcendent signified. And so it's a, you can only access those sorts of things symbolically, you know, analogically, um, not in direct terms. And there's a place for that. I mean, if you want to kind of push past human limits, you can't stick to dianoia and contemplative philosophy. You have to go beyond that and interface with these transcendent things and symbolic mediation is the only way we can organize right. that activity i mean the, the the mysteries were all about uh ritual performance that everything in the ritual had symbolic content um right so, so you're yeah. saying you just kind of you can't avoid symbology and, and metaphor anyway so you might as well, well, might as well. use it yeah you yeah, should use it. it um yeah so, so i that, think the the gospel um, story, it has a lot of mystic content and can be interpreted um, in a lot of ways. Like we're supposed to pick up our own cross. We can kind of see a model of ourselves and ethical ideals in uh, in a way that kind of goes beyond this explicit uh, philosophy. And we can kind of grasp those underlying archetypes of meaning um, more directly by dealing with the symbols. So you don't think uh, Christianity has been dealt a mortal blow by Darwin or in our you know, or Dawkins or, you know, there's uh, atheism seems very popular. I'm not sure how popular, but and people who claim to be Christian are only really very nominally so, I think. But you don't you do you see it as a growing sort of healthy thing, do you? Uh, no, not in the West. No, there no. are problems uh, coming from materialism, nihilism, uh, evolution. You know, I, the thing is, like, there there was a capacity for a Christian tradition, a more explicitly Platonized Christianity back in the day. You know, Origen believed in the eternity of the, wo the world. He could accept reincarnation. And I, I think that kind of Christianity would do very well today. Like, Vedanta is doing extremely well in the West. The idea of the avatar, the idea of, you know, following a guru, that there are these higher beings, everything. Like, people are not naturally averse to it in the West. It's just... Yeah, the, the limited kind of constrained orthodox version of Christianity um, rubs up against scientific and philosophical theories we have today, I think, because, you know, there were compromises made um, back in the days of uh, Irenaeus, 
um, you know, the, the very first kind of commentators, you can read their tone, read the way they had their discourse. And I just get the feeling that this is a very hostile discourse because there were, there were bad faith actors back then, people who use Christianity immediately for political purposes. I mean, for example, like what was happening in the Roman Empire um, around the time of the destruction of the, the Second Temple as the um, as Emperor Vespasian uh, came into power, the Flavian dynasty, like this was a very censorious regime. And that's exactly the time when the Gospels spread. Um, the gospel tracts are one of the most prevalent documents from that period of antiquity, the first centuries AD. There were a lot of surviving instances of it. And they, you know, something like Chris, they would not have just allowed Christianity to spread unchecked, you know, especially when it did appear that it might conflict with the state cult. Um, you know, Jews famously refused to worship the em uh, emperor when they were finally absorbed into the Roman state officially. Um, so I think I think that I think that's a lot too with like Julius Evola's uh, critique of Christianity in that it it worked it caught on spread in a plebeian way and worked against the but this is the, one of the criticisms you can level against it against the um, hier hierarchical structures of the paterfamilias and the ancient Roman uh, you know mm -hmm. bloodlines the necessity of and the the importance of those old traditional ways were kind of swept away the hierarchy of that for a religion that really appealed in a mass sense. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think these were, like I said, they were very censorious. They wanted to control the discourse. I don't think the, the Flavian dynasty, which was, I don't know if I should say exactly what I'm thinking now, but like this is when in Rome, a certain ethnic group got into positions of power. You know, people right. like Josephus were court historians, people of that same ilk um, yeah. getting into the Roman state. And uh, you know, they were engaged in social engineering projects. I think they were thinking, they were looking at these mystery cults. They, I mean, a Mithraism, uh, for example, I think came in from Persia, did it not? And Persia is this massive geopolitical yeah. rival. So they see that Persian religion is doing better than the Roman state cult in uh, among the plebeians, among their soldiers. And that's something they have to deal with, you know? So how do you combat this? Well, maybe you sanitize this Jewish cult so that it's not so, you know, dangerous. Um, you insert in their scriptures, you know, things like, you know, render to Caesar. What is Caesar's, you know, still pay your taxes guys. It, hmm. So you kind of soften it. You, you make it something that the state can work with. And, uh, and then they went with it. That doesn't mean though, that the mythic substrate wasn't an organic, real spiritual movement with power. I mean, the symbols wouldn't have had potency if there wasn't some kind of divine inspiration. Like myths, authentic myths are few and far between, and they, they arise beyond the power of like any one individual to create them. You know, that's that's my so do you do you see you, know. you don't do you see any personal conflict in the in seeing Christianity as anti heroic or anti anti hierarchy in its essence? Well it it can appear to be anti-hierarchy, but there, it's just emphasizing the the kind of dual hierarchy, uh, egalitarian side of of any organization. Like, in order for the optimum hierarchy to exist, like for a group of people to really follow a leader, the the people have to have a certain kind of equality between themselves. Like that, you can't believe. Um, that the, the, the pastor of your church or the leader of your community has like his favorites, his people that he values above others in order to get this kind of everyone in lockstep working together. The people generally have to have this sense of fraternity and we're all in this together. But the reason that's useful is that that renders them all kind of malleable, uh, in the face of a single kind of charismatic figure who who pushes the community in a given direction. So it's actually very hierarchical, like the initial Christian communities, uh, they, they were like the uh, initial Pythagorean communities, right? In order to join these communities, you gave up all your property. And the apostles, like a select set of, of men, had complete control over how society was organized for those early Christians. Um, not to say that the first social experiments were 100 percent 
uh, successful. But then, you know, later on, I think this same spirit did lead to building very large hierarchical structures like we see in the Catholic Church, like in the monastic orders. Equality, in some sense, is necessary for the most robust hierarchies. If you have a, a hierarchical view through and through, you're not going to have this group solidarity, which you actually need in order to build a real world hierarchy. Or even, I think, argue, argue, arguably for defending your position of power, spreading equality through the lower ranks helps in uh, in a Machiavellian way against your yes. rising enemies. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think that's yeah. a tactic that is used as well. So I'm gonna, I'll ask you this one, but I'm pretty sure I know the answer already because you've said you don't take the stories and myths literally. You sort of take them, you know, as you need to. But so you're not you don't find a huge, profound um problem with the uh what was it the Nag Hammadi library texts that were found that's a very contradictory Christian uh you know events and things that weren't included in the original yeah. Bible there's uh yeah there are a lot of stories there I've read I haven't read all of the Nag Hammadi scriptures but I've read a, a few and yeah. there are stories that are not included some of them seem obviously spurious some of them seem inspired um there's the Gospel of Thomas. Um, many people have speculated is actually the hypothesized Q document that is kind of the original uh, document that the gospel writers, especially you know the Synoptic Gospels, were working off of. Um, which is the Gospel of Thomas is just a list of sayings, basically, of Jesus. So people had already theorized that maybe Mark, uh, Matthew, and Luke were drawing on some set of phrases. Uh, you know, recorded sayings of Jesus, which was standard practice um, when you had a spiritual leader to like write down the things that they said. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're not totally, the Nag Hammadi scriptures are not totally at odds with uh, mainstream Christianity. There are definitely, definitely differences. Uh, again, the way I look at it is that all of these scriptures are part of a general rising mythological tide there, there are potent symbols and symbols are beyond any one person, you know, like collectively, just like the individual has this structure of meaning that they're trying to work out gradually and they have an intuition of it, a symbolic apprehension of it prior to this explicit apprehension. Uh, we collectively are working things out and like symbols bubble up to the surface and they have power that is beyond any one person's control. Of course, people try to control and say this set of scriptures are the authorized ones. These aren't. But I mean, it's a it's a decentralized movement of of spirit that produces these scriptures. Some of the gospel, some of the uh, mainstream texts, I think, are inspired. Some of the uh, Gnostic texts are inspired, but probably none of them like have it one hundred percent. And that ties in with this idea that like, if I was an avatar and I wanted to introduce this new order for a new age, then you would set up kind of the framework in and just give people what they need to get started building it out and then allow them to develop it in diverse ways just like you know kind of a quantum computational process where you kind of like go out or a brute force hacking attempt where you go out and just fill out all the possibilities and experiment that space and then like allow kind of providence and evolution i guess to weed it back down to like one thing at the end of the age i think that would be the most like you would expect the divine to act with grace you know using minimal effort to produce the maximal result um and so right. that's kind of what you would see with the way that the christian uh scriptures spread and yeah i think it, you shouldn't expect the complete version of christianity to ever be there until basically the time of the second coming and that's when okay the pieces can all be put back together we can all make sense of it and like it'll just be revealed it'll be you know something obvious to everybody at, at the okay, end so you, and you 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 have a literal belief in this in the second coming do you um yeah you do oh, okay and so you believe in heaven and hell yeah well i believe in heavens and hells i think the earth can become either a heaven or a hell and I also believe in many worlds interpretation. So for me, the world branches depending on it's observer dependent, like which which path the world takes for you is dependent on your internal condition, which is, again, this kind of reciprocity principle, one of the karmic dynamics that Jesus describes. Divine reciprocity. The courage would love this uh, this talk. You should you should become his guru and uh, 
He needs a bit of more. Uh, I don't think Kurt more. is going to listen to me when it comes to. It. Oh, you never know. You're very rational. You might, uh, you know. We I mean, we have a history. I don't think he's going to oh, pay dear, attention no. to my Christianity. Right, right. Um, what was I going to say? Oh God, I've lost it again. Uh, oh yeah. So you um, when you, like so you weren't profoundly. You said you were into the uh, Vedic uh, mm -hmm. religion, and you've obviously. You know the story of error and so so forth, and you're talk, talking about heaven, hell, in a more worldly sense. There, so you don't you don't you don't believe in a perpetual hell for sinners. Is that right? I think that hell can potentially be perpetual. Um, the really? yeah, well, you can always sink a who little bit lower. It? What's yeah. up? Who would deserve it? <laughs> someone Ten who continually years. sinned. You know, someone who kind of yeah. brought it on themselves continuously by. Uh, basically maintaining a kind of egoistic division between self and other uh, perpetually, because that's the only way that you could endure is if you clung to something that you thought was exclusive to you and then had an oppositional force that was the source of your suffering. And that psychological divide is, is ultimately like the source of all suffering. It's selfishness. It's this ego problem that the East Eastern religions talk about. So if you like, really have this self-obsession and always kind of exclusively focus on trying to help yourself, then you would continually descend until you had that conversion experience. On the other hand, there probably is a kind of natural gravity. When I say it's potentially um, infinite in time, that's like saying, you know, the, the probability distribution of an electron in a given atom potentially extends to the ends of the universe, right? These tails are very small uh, probabilities, but they extend very wide in space. So like, it's technically possible that you could suffer eternally, but there will always be, you know, some form of divine intervention and divine intervention, I think is just on a spectrum of that we do observe in the real world of uh, interference by higher beings over lower beings. There is this compassionate instinct, you know, higher parents want to help children um, you know, people who are in charge of livestock want to care for the animals. There is care and compassion and an attempt at elevation throughout uh, human society. And so you would expect that if, if there are higher beings than humans, and we respect especially the humans who are compassionate and try to help other creatures, then higher beings would also have those same inclinations and they would have more power than us. And so they could reach down and help uh those kind of wretches in, in the lower worlds. Um, right. So yeah, there, there would always be hands up and it's, it's not like you'd be hopeless to escape hell. And there's also some of that in the Christian tradition as well. Like Jesus descends to the depths of hell and offers salvation, even to the people who are already in hell. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some Christians like interpreting that in terms of like, well, that's how you get over the problem of like, well, what, what about people who were born before Jesus came? Uh, you know, kind of, it, historicizing the whole narrative and like this is something that jesus did once to make up for the fact that they never heard of him before so then he goes down and meets them but it's really like i think an eternal archetypal movement of divine energies descending all the way to the lowest worlds and exerting that suspending pull back up it sounds um, very it sounds very vedic to me and in fact yeah. they have they do i didn't realize until i talked with one uh, a while ago now that they actually have a concept of hell as well. It's it's not forever. It's a sort of temporary place of suffering. Um, I don't know. That was in part of the re reincarnation idea as well. That they also had it, but they well, didn't. yeah. I mean, yeah. some uh, Vedic thinkers would say the world is kind of a hell. You know, you can take that uh, world renouncing side of uh, the Upanishadic philosophy seriously and say it's a bit like know, Plotinus it's... is a bit that way, but he doesn't think it's a hell. It's just that it's something right. to be rejected yeah. it's not ideal but uh it's, it's not as good as the good itself you know the good wouldn't create something that was the opposite of itself it would create an extension and emanation of itself however it's still better to you know get the original product than than the imitation yeah. personally i really enjoy the world i think it's quite good even despite all the uh, problems that can be upsetting but uh it's better to have a kind of aloofness is my personal philosophy mm -hmm. and it, it, it's Detachment. platonic it's platonic in its way yeah a certain kind of um don't get to it. You, there's so, so much of it. I guess it's sort of stoic as well, but you know, it's so many things are out of your hands and don't get hung up on certain things and enjoy yourself as, as much as you can while being um, moral. Um, 
in the I would say platonic sense. I don't have like morally speaking. So you you would be would you be more biblical or platonic in your morals? Can I ask you that? Does that make sense? Uh, I'm probably more platonic in my morals. I'm more Greek. You know, the, the whole issue of like the lack of heroism in mm -hmm. um, the New Testament. There is something to it, I think, because it's all about the kind of inner man, you know, in the heroic act of the inner man is renunciation. It is compassion. It is these things that don't appear, you know, you're not going to see Arnold Schwarzenegger starring in a movie about these virtues, you know, but but they are still an important part of like becoming a better man. And that that ideal of excellence, you know, the real aristocracy I hold uh, to span across like all of human activity. And there is a virtue, a real moral virtue in just being good at things. You know, I think a lot of people want to say, you know, I am a good person because of the way I feel because of my relationships with others. But I'm asking, okay, but what do you do with your time? And how are you making the world a better place? How are you like improving things with your actions? Uh, I made a video not too long ago basically to that effect that like you can't be good if you're not good at things that yeah. that connection is can get lost in christianity but it's there uh, i would say still um in the old testament you get some of those heroic values but then on the other hand like the jews are constantly tricking their their enemies and like in subtle ways like infiltrating the city and and doing shady it's not like uh you know the ancient yeah. near eastern uh war epics would always emphasize these single heroic you know a gilgamesh or like the, the accounts of egyptian wars would say like the pharaoh himself slayed you know 400 uh men and he brought back the right hands and you know all of these outlandish accounts there's something like that in the bible but he but yeah i mean we're dealing with a, a decline in heroic virtue from the bronze age down through the iron age and then like the concept of of virtue and you know what constitutes a, a heroic individual became more self-reflective internal and like do i have a fondness for the bronze age and I, do i want to see that schwarzenegger archetype uh, actualized i do and maybe there's room for both but yeah that is i'm more platonic in my values i think yeah that's good yeah well that is really the gift the greeks gave us is that idea of excellence and idealizing things that is not, yeah, the Bible is more about perfecting your um, piety and showing your, you know, godliness, let's say. Not so much, I can't think of very much at all about doing things in the world, certainly in the New Testament, I could be wrong. But the Greeks are all about that. I mean, that's really what you get from it is that you should be, you know, you need to work hard, work hard at first observing things as carefully as you can mm -hmm. to get any kind of remotely clear picture. And then you got to work hard as hard as you can uh, on something to better things and that with an idea of goodness and even like while speculating about what goodness is at the same time so you really get as good an idea of goodness as you can and you head towards these goals that are unreachable in many ways but you you know head for them anyways that's what i get from greek philosophy and the like right. the innovations that came out of that period are you know i don't i can't think of anything comparable can you like well uh, yeah it's the basis of civilization in the first place basically all mathematical engineering knowledge like everything that modern science is built off of was achieved by the greeks and then a couple persians maybe an arab or two and then germans like, well there was the sumerians and the egyptians too were pretty good the sumerians yeah, did the writing. it's not scientific for them it's all like yeah. you know worked out over centuries these yeah. kind of general rules of thumb mm -hmm. science begins with the greeks for sure yeah 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 okay so um, yeah, you're a very hard man to disagree with, even though I do think I'm not sure I'm I can't say anything for sure. But I do think maybe the age of Christianity has come and gone. I'm not sure. Maybe not. Or at least as we know it, maybe you would agree with that. And at least it's going to. I think a, a new kind of Christianity would be necessary. Um, but can I ask you, you know, the, yeah. the main reason that I went for Christianity was that this guru figure had to be activated for me, the idea of an avatar has to be present, you know, the, the gods would be, act to try to, um, to influence the world. I think, yeah. you know, there, there has to be some hand up, some higher figure that you're looking to in your worship. So who is that for you and how do you, you know, enact that in your practice? Yeah, I have kind of a, because I'm 
because I have to be honest with myself and admit to myself how indecisive I am on the matter. I keep an idea of God where I think of sort of Deus in the even Indo-European, like in the broad sense, in every in every all the religions. Yeah. It's the same way you might think Plotinus talks about him. Very much so, I would say. And I do sort of at times still even might pray to Jesus out of like a habit and like <laughs> certain, well, you know, just like it's there. There's and power in the name of Jesus. That's I can't true. escape it. It was always with me, but yeah. frankly, I'm more pagan than I am Christian. If and I'm yeah. this is the weird duality and these ridiculous syncretism and new aging nonsense of my belief that's embarrassing to talk about. <laughs> but I can't I can't honestly honestly pick anything too specific. Hmm. And say this is it. I'm this for sure. And like I often pray to uh, Minerva, frankly, because uh, I am because I am so enamored with the Athenian age. Let's say mm -hmm. it feels like that was something that was like a guru who inspired me. I feel like um, yeah, you know? yeah, and that is in line with Neoplatonic practice. You know, Proclus also prayed to Minerva, and uh, yeah, the idea that you have your kind of titular spirit, and then the kind of deity that that spirit is in the train of and that there is some somebody that each of us should be kind of oriented around but then you know there's there's the issue of having a common figure to rally around with larger the larger society you know western europe was united in effectively a single political entity for a few centuries there because there was this one singular figure uniting all of us yeah. where in in rome had to have one singular figure and they just said okay the emperor is a god and that's one way to do it i don't think we're going to pull that off so yeah. there's something the centralizing principle of having a single exemplar that everyone accepts like yes that is the way to go the sky um, father <laughs> sky sky father but like a man that's more relatable i think than the sky father is necessary because you can't let this also ties into what Proclus would say about the nature of the Greek myths, that they they are not figures to be uh, imitated. Like you, if you acted like Zeus acts in the Greek myths, then you would be a, a very dangerous member of society. You know, it's not a stable uh, state of things. Like Zeus represents with, with those kinds of transgressive acts. You know the raping and all of the kind of having the bickering with his wife and fighting with other gods. And like he had slayed his father <laughs> off the use of patricide. Um, like the, these things kind of represent the, the exempt nature of the Supreme power. And there's something too exempt about it. It's too beyond. And that uh, the two colorful narratives that crop up around those figures are not like moral exemplars. They're not somebody that we could accept like, yes, that is moral perfection. So the question is then, what do you have as a as an exemplar of, of moral perfection now in our world? Um, uh, I don't I don't think any, there's any other candidate, a serious candidate um, beyond Jesus or maybe the Buddha, but uh, Buddhism I think has limitations in the way that its institutions have cropped up it does uh kind of devolves into a form of hedonism often you know where they're it's all about this internal mystic experience and you know the irony is that's kind of what plato was responding to too in athens the whole orphic uh cult uh complex the eleusinian mysteries being very popular it was about like experiencing some you know, deeper reality for yourself. And it was very emotivist and very like, you know, personally oriented. And Plato wanted to like kind of return to that more ancient form of worship that really elevated the individual beings of the gods and higher beings and like orienting towards the community as a whole rather than like individual experience. So Buddhism has that problem. I Buddhism mean, is very popular. Buddhism's growing quite popular lately. I've noticed. I've just seen because seen we're that. hedonistic. I think because the the sal the doctrine of salvation has nothing to do with you know sacrificing for others. There's no inherent altruism in Buddhism. Um, there's really no inherent collective ethos. It, I mean, the Buddha himself ha had his pick 
of all different spiritual paths, the, the most developed spiritual paths were available to that figure, uh, Sakyamuni, compared to any other period in history. Like he had the best spiritual technologies available to him. And he decided, you know, like, actually, none of these are good enough. I'm going to do my own thing. And well, that's... Let, me ask, let me ask you this. As someone so re well read in uh, Plato and Neoplatonism, who, what would you think Plato would uh, think of Buddhism or the Neoplatonists like Proclus? What would the, uh, the Buddhism we have, what would their assessment of it be, do you think? Would you guess? Would you have a guess? Um, I think it would be the problem with Buddhism is the elevation of basically it, it's too much of a humanist faith. It's too much about what is within the capacities of human beings. And there's not too much emphasis on that divine inspiration on channeling higher beings and really, you know, using their guidance and structuring society according to their will you know buddhism is like escapist in a way but then i've also heard narratives to the effect that early buddhism was really just an extension of the upanishadic philosophy it's the same as advaita vedanta it is fundamentally no different um but obviously buddhism has taken um uh, a, a turn away. I mean, it rejects the Vedas. It rejects the the sacredness of these scriptures. Like it kind of nominally accepts the existence of gods, but then doesn't exactly care about the gods. You know, it's it's all about this pursuit of some individual experience. And I think that's what Plato would have disagreed with. Would Plato have disagreed with Proclus? I don't. I don't necessarily think so. I mean, I personally, I do think that Plato would have seen the utility of Christianity. I think he would have recognized. Like if he thought of it as a noble lie or not, that this is a the right kind of of myth uh, to galvanize people and and introduce order into the state. And it has been like Platonists have used Christianity in that way. I mean, I think there's a long history of like people who have called themselves Christians, but then kind of really had their heart with Plato. And maybe Plato would have taken a similar kind of tact there. Um, suspect he yeah, would. I don't know. I'd have a hard, hard time with that. Like myself, I don't. Like I said, I've, I haven't got a huge amount of the Bible myself personally. It's only that I have a history with it, inescapably being raised with it. Do I have any link at all? Is what I feel like. Not like when I, I, I agree with Grimes that when you read Plato and Homer, and uh, you know, Pyth you know what we have, Pythagoras, Parmenides, any of them, um, you get, you can, well, you can find something new every time you look at it, and it's incredibly profound. Mm -hmm. And in, in the way that the Bible isn't, um, frankly, for me, anyways. Uh, so, like, I, I agree that everything you need is there myself. Yeah. Well, and that gets into the deficiencies with the Bible that we have that I also agree with. You right. know, there are also Gnostic scriptures. Um, I think uh, if if a church came around that included some of those Gnostic scriptures that like was explicitly a Platonist. Uh, version of Christianity, then you might be able to integrate a little more substance. And then also tie that back to the idea that Christianity was probably an initiatic tradition, where like, if you wanted to become uh, an initiate into it, at first, you would only have access to these milk, right? The idea of like, some people have spiritual milk, some people uh, mature past that and actually get the meat of the faith. Well, I think the meat would have involved doctrines that were meant to be kept among the elect yeah. and maybe that's where the substance so it makes sense that if it was this deeper initiatic tradition that was then kind of made into one universal safe exoteric thing then we would have lost the kind of core what was deeper and more intellectual in it and there are genuine you know intellectual insights in the gnostic text i haven't explored them enough um my i haven't really been that focused on the spiritual side or like the religious side uh, of all of this um in the last years i've mainly stuck more to the kind of contemplative philosophy aspect you know what's the best system how do i put it all together and then even more recently i just have come to the conclusion that like the world needs more uh education on platonic philosophy and it needs to be more accessible to people and so that's kind of just what i've yeah. oh, been I definitely, feeling I definitely agree about that yeah and i do agree that it needs a it's best best described in a vehicle of faith which 
which they wisely grafted it into Christianity, you know, and that was, as you say, it was a good and successful thing to do. But then, you know, you honestly have to, for my part, I have to honestly say, well, that is the best part of the Christianity was the, the Platonism they grafted into it for me anyway. But, but you, you, you accept that you realize that you see it as a vehicle. Well, you have a genuine faith as well. You have to, uh, you know, say well, well. but also like it's the Platonism, but you could equally say it's the perennialism. It is what is eternal that Christianity reflects that makes right. it good. Not what, not what's uh, specific to it. Right. Right. You can say that. Yeah. And in terms of what Platon would have thought, I mean, the, the parts that are the, the thing that is difficult about Christianity is also its great strength, I would say, which is this sort of chosenite, as you say, derived from the, let's say, Mithras and other cults, the, you know, you have to be in the cult uh, or you're going to hell. And it's this rejection of that, like we see the more widespread, like I was complaining about earlier, the widespread rejection of pagan thought and philosophy, which can often occur with that, where you've got to draw the line. Uh, that's its problem and its strength, I would say. What do you... Well, there, yeah. That? Uh, it, that us and them chosen people dynamic, that is the one thing that the Jewish, Jewish scriptures explore more than anybody else. Probably the, the problem of identity and like having a tightly defined coherent thing that your people sticks to and keeps them in, in existence. And the idea is that their traditions, their God saves them. And meanwhile, the peoples around them who are led astray by different cults and different ideas and different human wisdom are all scattered, right? But this one, you know, the, the story of the, the people over the centuries is an interesting aspect there. I see that as kind of like metaphorical for our circumstance. We're all like, uh, you know, I can kind of identify with the exile who doesn't have, you know, their, their homeland per se, and is trying to, cut out that new Israel for themselves. I can see like that it's a perennial struggle um, for uh, for sovereignty, for a people, for like an expression of of that people. And it it's it's interesting because it's such a parochial idea and yet it does universalize because we're all in our own, you know, exclusive groups. We're all in our own tradition. We're all looking for our own tradition. So it is a universal feature of the human condition to be parochial. And the Jews exemplify that aspect, the chosen I, us versus them aspect. And so if you universalize it to a, with Christianity and like make that, we are, we're all in the position of Israel in a certain way, then um, it can also be a political model uh, that like, I don't know, you can use it to justify the idea, um, that it's important for, um, a nation or a, a group to have like, um, I don't know, like self, like if, if it matters for the Jews, if it matters that they aren't impeded on by imperial forces. They aren't cast into exile. They're given a place. Like if you accept that that's part of the human condition, that's part of where we all all are, then that can be a kind of moral grounding politically today. I'm rambling a little bit uh, on this and tiptoeing around. I know around. what you mean. Yeah. No, yeah, I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. I, I understood you. But um, what was I going to say? You're so what would your what would you say to um so contemporary pagans and the revival in paganism that's going on like what's your is your attitude towards that you'd like to re-educate them or do you see them as just perfectly fine How, what's your attitude towards them well i do believe one single figure uh should be accepted universally um, if, if someone wants to, like a lot of pagans will accept that Jesus was a great moral teacher, at least, you know, this has been a move in intellectual circles in the West throughout the enlightenment as well. Like, you know, the Jeffersonian Bible accepting the moral message, but then rejecting the metaphysics and miracles. Um, you know, I think it, it would be, the world would be a better place if we expected God to exact like justice at a certain point in history, like the expectation of the end times, the idea that there will be a final 
structure to the world, political structure to the world, it like orients us towards like that fate of the world aspect, the uh, eschatological element of the Abrahamic faiths is a, a real driving force of them and keeps them potent and keeps them active in looking at like the broader world situation. And it's not like that's completely absent in, I mean, it's there in Buddhism and Hinduism as well with Kalki and Hinduism and uh, Maitreya and Buddhism, the kind of final figure that comes at the end, exacts justice and then institutes the new order. So there are parallels also in Zoroastrianism, they expected this kind of uh, savior, Sayoshant, the savior figure at the end of history. Yeah. So I think there's a utility to that. There's a lot of precedent for that. For that, yeah. there's even I mean, there's eschatology built into Norse paganism as well, with uh, yeah. you know Ragnarok and the I don't know if there's one key savior figure in the Ragnarok story. Uh, is, does Baldur come back? I can't even. Uh, Ash quite... and Enla are the two surviving humans at the end. Of... I, oh yeah, yeah. no, a few of the gods come back. You're right. A few of the lesser ones I don't even remember their names, but yeah. They come there's a few of them come around again i think yeah. yeah so for i look at that and i always have as like their humanity knows something at a deep level about the fate of humanity that it needs to express to itself in symbolic terms and we've had various ways of representing that and this like universal salvation universal judgment uh end of history talk yeah. is it's not something i think that can be discarded and there's right. like practically no way of preparing for that end state for like navigating towards that end state unless we can agree on something so paganism doesn't have that the necessary ecumenicalism to like shape the the future of the planet i think whereas christianity because it's an inherently centralizing religion okay so you would see you would see it as that. flawed you you wouldn't you wouldn't just be happy to see that they're not atheists you would see them as flawed and needing needing to be worked on in your opinion. it's it's not so like because what they are focused on i think generally is good although i have heard of and seen neo-pagan groups that they say they're doing rituals when really they're just like taking psychedelic mushrooms and like <laughs> having fist fights and stuff yeah. <laughs> honestly so that would be a harsh thing to do when you're high in mushrooms actually. Oh, I, I imagine actually it'd be pretty enjoyable, really? but okay. it, yeah, there's, uh, there's no like quality control on paganism. So there are a lot of pagan groups. I think that are probably not spiritually helping, uh, the people who are following them. That's an issue, but I think there, there are earnest, good faith pagans who are trying to worship the gods, worship higher beings, um, you know, live their life in accordance with the values of their ancestors and all of that. I think they can keep, that's all good even the, the names of the individual gods, I would say that it would be prudent to question vocabulary. Like the, the Neoplatonic talk of gods versus the first god versus the one is confused. Like it's, a, it's an issue of vocabulary, what, what place the gods have versus this ultimate divine principle. And you can use different words for it and you can accept that, okay, th this level of beings, the Henads and Proclus' system, is just the gods and then beyond that we can call it something else i perhaps but like because in our society god has always meant this kind of metaphysical first principle of being that's like aristotle's definition of god that's the way we've thought about god in the west uh it might be a good idea if pagans like chose to call uh the gods the traditional gods by some other name you know i, I don't know what that name would be but that's just an issue of, of terminology. Like I said, I don't care what they call these beings. I accept that those beings exist. There are higher beings. They are Those higher beings are closer to the highest being, which I would be totally comfortable calling God. I think Christians would be comfortable seeing at least an affinity between the concept of the one in Platonism and God the Father, like Plotinus. I mean, it's so close in Plotinus that you have the trinity um, of uh, the one uh, into mind and soul. And there's something like that in Christianity. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would say that their pagans probably could benefit from, uh, accepting the moral teachings of Christ. And if they took a step further and said like, yes, God doesn't just act in each community for each particular people, but he all, there is a universal 
salvation of humanity in the works. And if they could see right. that and accept that, like, there is a, a universal savior figure that we should all be expecting, that would be good. Even if they didn't say, like, I don't know if Jesus himself is this, but I expect that the Sayushant, Maitreya, Kalki, you know, the second coming of Christ, that guy is is a reality that we should be looking forward to. That would be a positive step. Okay, let me let me let me put it to you this way. Let me hit you with a, the impossible question here. Like, because I'd say if I was to be critical of that, I would say, well, your greatest hero is philosophically. I mean, well, arguably even at least in line or not maybe over Jesus are all we're all pagans. But so you have let's say there's a hypothetical situation. I've said this before. Um, what is it? So there, the world's there's a huge catastrophe and all the books are being destroyed. And you have a choice for posterity for future generations to save either the works of Plato and the ne and the Neoplatonists or the Bible. What would you choose? <laughs> uh yeah well i'm not the biggest fan of the bible as it exists anyway uh i think honestly <laughs> well, yeah yeah okay, it would be right. plato <laughs> see a lot of christians would not like that and like they get upset like do you do you not get a lot of pushback from other christians no you don't find i guess you're very good at explaining yourself and they can't really they don't even know what's going on they, <laughs> yeah so the christians don't generally uh try to confront me about my uh heresies so and what do you how do you deal with the uh issues around plato with the there's this kind of at least online in our circles these uh nietzschean sort of hatred for pa plato has become kind of popular just from like i don't know what i, I don't get the feeling people have been reading either nietzsche or plato <laughs> but um what's yeah. your response to them quickly just as a final thing here i think i've covered everything yeah, I don't think there's a coherent Nietzschean critique. I mean, the the idea that like it's otherworldly, it focuses on this realm of forms that, okay, Nietzsche may not like that kind of thinking. It doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> like Nietzsche doesn't make arguments against Plato. Um, so I, don't, I just don't think it has any real substance. And there's the, I get the drive to reject Plato and reject like the classical European philosophical tradition in favor of more recent developments that try to throw it all away because it saves you on homework. Like if, if Nietzsche was right or if Descartes was right, right. And we can kind of throw away the history of philosophy and start as if we were starting from scratch, like, great. Now I, I have to, I can just kind of ignore 2000 years of philosophical history and still say that I'm educated because I read Descartes. You know, it's sort of like that. Like it, it just well, even Descartes, even Descartes' rationalism was it was he got it from because he was visited by an angel. <laughs> which is, is that so? Hmm. That's, according, according to himself, yeah, his original he was it was a revelation. He was visited in a dream or some a reality by an angel, and that's what that's what. And he was told to. Oh, I forget. I can't say off the top of my head, but like basically the, uh, basically to uh, you know invest and study in uh, rationalism or what you know. <laughs> But it was a it was a totally, uh, you know, metaphysical event. Well, yeah, and I don't want to counter signal Descartes too strongly. I mean, he did change uh, the trajectory of our civilization, and the Cartesians made a lot of advances when it comes to like Descartes himself made advances in mathematics. And in my book, yeah. like if you've discovered new math, then I, I accept that like oh, you, you, yeah, yeah. you matter. <laughs> oh yeah. You can't. Yeah. I can't even, yeah. I, I was always terrible at math to be honest. Higher math. It wasn't very good, but um, yeah, I think I've kept you long enough there. That's quite a thorough, I think. Is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't in regards to this? I don't think so. You do anything you uh, more to say about it as a summary? No, just no. Uh, I mean, my Christian Platonism is very different than what might be called Christian Platonism in another sense. I know there is a tradition of Christian Platonism, so-called, um, uh, that sticks closer to like mainstream Christian theological positions. Uh, I just, I, you know, my, the philosophy that I came to in my own kind of searching through things and trying to figure the world out happened to align with Vedanta. And then I found that that happened to align with Plato. And then using all of this framework, I started interpreting comparative mythology. And I saw like the validity of the sim at least the symbolic truth of Christianity. And I accepted it. So it's kind of an unusual path to get to Christianity. But uh, I think it is tenable. It's workable for me. Um, but then maybe I'm just an oddball and I can't recommend it to others necessarily. <laughs> uh yeah i can't guarantee these results well no that's that's why i would say it's so difficult to disagree with you and it's so reasonable is because you haven't come at it from an angle of having 
the belief and not wanting to give up the belief and being utterly biased all the way along. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I was an atheist thing. on and off as a kid. You know, I, I yeah. went to church, but I didn't always believe then. So I've always had, kind of had an open mind and have been trying to figure it yeah. out. I've always maintained that's the best way to religion is to have to go through that atheist phase and to rationally end up coming because then you've at least proven to yourself that it's not fear of death or something excluding you yeah. from other ideas is you're actually finding a rash a reason a reasonable rational path back mm. you know so it's, it's got to be the best way i think yeah. and uh right. you know if we are uh, believers we have to think well this is what god intended us to do you know mm. well yeah i mean ultimately there's not inherent tension between the philosophical method and and faith i i, I would say that socrates is an excellent exemplar of a, a spiritual faith-based path through life. He had intense faith in his daimon, in the rightness of his cause. You know, if you it, you need faith, but that balance of faith and doubt is like you need doubt for certain things to avoid mistakes. You need faith to really, to even build a system. Like you have to care about it at least. Like even if you treat it at bottom as a hypothesis potentially, still like it needs you have to have a sensitivity at least to like the idea that maybe some higher thing some form some god some daimon is speaking through to you and you have to be ready willing to to accept those energies uh but yeah at the same time not like going full schizo and just believing any voice that comes into your head uh so faith and doubt platonism works it out i think uh, we can apply the way that Socrates approached his faith to the way we might approach a future kind of Christianity. That might be a good model, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. So, um, thanks a lot, Arvon. That's very informative and, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Is there anything you're, I don't know if you want to, you doing anything you want to plug or anything or, uh, well, I have my reading group, so um, there's I have two YouTube YouTube channels. One that I've had for a long time that I post random things that I'm thinking about, and then one that I just started called Understanding Plato. You can find my Skype and Patreon links in both. Um, if you want to get involved in reading groups, you can message me on Skype. I've been doing signups through Patreon because I am trying to get more professional with this. And one day I'd like to build a school. I think a new platonic academy is in order and uh if i can help forward that at all i will so anyway that's uh that's what i'm currently doing the reading yeah, i believe you, you'd be a good man for that job you'd be a good man well thank you brian it was very nice talking with you as well yeah and uh thanks for coming on we'll talk to you later all right goodbye bye bye